This is week two of this new series, Great. Um, and last week we, we started by, by looking at the setting, the context um, where Jesus said these words. And um, either you, I would encourage you to either listen to it or watch it or at least read Matthew 21 and 22 because it's so much fun. That passage is so much fun to see how Jesus interacts with the religious leaders of the day and, and uh, just kind of, I guess the, the Facebook thing would be destroys them because that's what you see everywhere now. So-and-so destroyed somebody. It's like, I don't know where that comes from, but, but Jesus stood up and he, 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 he gave them no room, no quarter, and at the end it says that they dared not ask him any more questions. Isn't that cool? That's wisdom. Wisdom at work. Before I start, I just want to say welcome to all y'all. Glad you're here. Um, what, a, what an opportunity we have to come together. Today is such an awesome day because we've got communion. We've got baptism. We have our luncheon. And it's, it's really a community day. And I just want to encourage you, if you can stay for the baptism especially, it's going to be it, we're, we're going to do it first, right after church, before we eat, so you can stay for the baptism and then go. Um, but if you can stay to eat and fellowship, it is always a great time. And it really is part of, part of us coming together is building community. So make every effort, if you would, to stay and to fellowship. And if there's not enough food, we'll go get some pizza or something. Okay? Pardon? Mountain High Pizza Pie. But today, we're going we're gonna to dig in a little bit at, and look at a couple of words that uh, make the whole difference, I think, in, in how you read this, this passage of Scripture. So let's pray. Father God, we just come to you and we ask you to come and to bless and to speak to us. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that every single person would hear from you. Um, whether it's through this message or whether it's through your Holy Spirit just speaking to them or a conversation that we have as we eat or as we share. God, I just pray that uh, every person would be touched by you, they'd encounter you, they'd sense your love and passion that you have for them, and that they'd leave here changed for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The Great Commandment. Before we get to the Great Commandment, though, I've got a couple questions to ask you. Where does, where does pride quarrels, and fights come from? Self, the devil. Anybody else got any suggestions or ideas? Ego. How about why are you jealous and murderous and crave for what you don't have? Sensual desires. All I did was paraphrase a passage of Scripture and put it in question form, by the way. Have you guessed what, what passage it is yet? No? Nope. Why are you worried, fearful, stressed, and struggling? Pardon? Focused on yourself. That's a good answer. Not trusting. Are we having fun yet today? I'm having fun. I like this. Today, today I give you permission. Every Sunday we shouldn't do this. But today, let's have a, let's have a communication, Okay? So these questions, I think every one of us can relate to one of these things because we either struggle with pride or we know somebody who struggles with pride. And chances are, if we struggle with pride, we don't know we struggle with pride. But everybody else around you knows you struggle with pride. And in your family, do you ever have quarrels? Any kind of... No? No, never. That's because you don't have kids. <laughs> In the church, are there ever, ever any quarrels in the church? All we are is one big family. Amen. So we have quarrels, we have, we have misunderstandings, and people take offense, all these things happen. Um, hopefully we're not getting into fights. Um, no fisticuffs, please. Anybody in here admit to being jealous sometimes? Somebody else has something you want and you can't get it? And in this passage of Scripture, it says that it leads you to do murder. Hopefully none of us are there. And we covet, we crave for those things that we don't have, that somebody else has. Anybody? I do. Not as much as I used to, though. I'm being changed from glory to glory, from strength to strength. Amen. Come on. 
I, I, um, I hope that I will overcome worrying. Worrying is, is faithfulness. I mean, it's faithlessness. It's not having faith. Worrying is caused by not trusting in God. Fear is the same thing. Are you fearful? I mean, have you watched the news this week? I mean, there's some scary stuff going on in our world. I mean, I don't know exactly what happened in North Korea, but they did something that was big enough to cause an earthquake. Did you watch that? It's a scary world that we live in. Are we fearful? Are you stressed out? I mean, I, I can look around the room and probably by the color of your skin, your redness or the, or the tension in your eyebrow, your up here, whatever that is, forehead, <laughs> or, or the twitch in your hand when you're drinking your coffee, your 18th cup of the day. <laughs> I know it could. But for those that don't have a trauma, if, there, if there's that going on, it's stress. You know, and some stress is good for us. How many of you like roller coasters? You go on a roller coaster, it stresses you, but you like it. But the kind of stress that I'm talking about is when you open up your mail and you've got bills that you don't have money to pay. Or you have a loved one who is, who is sick. Or you have a loved one that's gone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And struggling, whether it's struggling with our faith, I mean, honestly, honestly, we all struggle with our faith sometimes. I do, I'll admit it. There are things that happen in this world that don't make any sense to me. And I have to just trust that God is a good, good Father. And that He knows. He sees the beginning from the end. So what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? James 4, 1 through 10. Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war and take it away from them. I lost my place. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask for God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get what you, what, what you ask for because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Now, I put this all up here so we can get to the end of it in context, okay? You adulterers, imagine if a pastor stood up and told, called the church that. Well, James is writing to the Jewish church, and he says, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the Scriptures mean when they say that, that the Spirit of God is placed within us, is filled with envy? But He gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires as the Scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I like that. Be humble. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I could preach a message on that sentence right there. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Father, again, we thank you for your word, and I pray again that it would penetrate, penetrate, penetrate our hearts, our minds, our souls, that you get glory from it. In Jesus' name, amen. So why did I start here when we're talking about the great commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? Why did I start here? Because this word, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So there's the word all. Let's just look at the word all for a second. I'll come back to that. All. All. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. All. Now, I could do a, if, if we could do an um, anonymous poll, how many of us would be able to say that we love the Lord with all? Our heart, all our soul, all our mind. 
The word all means whole, my whole heart. It means complete, my complete heart. It means undivided. So this is where the problem is. We've got division in our hearts. Let me go back here, okay? No, don't, don't. I like that. Dipsukos. That word that I've underlined, double-minded, is, is one word in Greek. It's dipsukos. And it literally means twice souls. So in you, and I've said this before, it's interesting to me, that I recognize in myself, and hopefully you recognize in yourself, that spiritually I tend to be schizophrenic. I shouldn't because the old man is supposed to be dead. But there's this battle that wages within me, isn't there? Do you have a battle waging within? You want to do what's right, but you don't do it, and you don't do what you should, and like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. And you end up stressed. You end up fearful. You end up worried. You end up wanting what you don't have because your flesh takes over. That's why we quarrel. That's why we fight. That's why we have pride. That's why all those things are there is because we're double-minded. If we could just love God with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, then those things would disappear. And we're not even getting to the second commandment, which is like unto it. If Just think about your world. If you could get your focus on him and him alone, would it matter what anybody else is doing? Would you want something somebody else has? Would you have desires for for this ministry or for that position or, or that thing? No, because you would have the only thing that counts is knowing that your good, good father loves you. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Your heart is is the center of your being. All your soul, your soul is your very, your your life, your, your, your will and your emotions, your soul and your mind, your intellect. You don't have to shut off your brain to be a follower of Christ. Hopefully, you're not doing that. There's a measure of faith, but, but you should be able to think your way through and fall in love with him using your mind. C.S. Lewis was brilliant, and he used his mind to come to Christ. The opposite of all is partial. It's divided. It's fickle. And... <laughs> I've known some fickle Christians. Have you? Nobody knows any fickle Christians. The ones that the ones that are here today and gone tomorrow because the wind blew the other way, because they got they got offended by some little thing and off they go. That's fickleness. Or they were walking with God with everything in them. And then one of two things happens. I've seen this both ways. Either things get really good, they don't need God anymore. Or something bad happens and they blame God and run away from him. If you love God with all your heart, you're not going to be fickle. You're not going to be faithless. You're going to be faithful through the years, finishing well. It doesn't really matter how well you start. It matters how well you finish. A divided heart is unstable. And we'll see that in in James chapter 1. We're going to get there in a minute. It's unstable. There's no stability in the life of somebody who has a divided heart. You know, Abraham Lincoln quoted Jesus. Did you know that? During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said it first, by the way. If you have a divided heart, you're going to be unstable. In all of your ways, it says in James, not just in your faith, but unstable in all of your ways. You're going to be drifting around, floating from here to there. Not ever getting any roots. Never make, not being able to make commitments that stand and last. It's interesting because um, in talking with my pastor, Pastor Rick Menard, I had, a, I had an opportunity to talk with him a few weeks ago about some, some visions that I have, some ideas that I have. And he challenged me. And he said, he, he mentioned some names from the Northeast Kingdom. Pastor Joel Battaglia at Linden Bible Church, been there for 25 years. Pastor Paul Powers at, at Union Baptist Church, he just retired after serving there for 35, 40 years. All these men, and he said, what comes to your mind when I mention their names? And I said, faithful. See, it's not how well you finish, it's how well you end. 
been there for 25, 30, 40, 50 years, still serving, even though it's hard, even though there might not be the fruit you hope for, even though that's, that, that takes a whole heart. One of, my, one of my pastor friends, a guy named Andrew Chrysler and his wife, Debbie, pastor a church up in the islands, up in Alberg. And they challenged me. Their faithfulness is amazing. When they first came there, there was four people in the church. Them and the pastor and his wife. And they took over the church, and for a little while, there was, there was only a handful of people. I'm talking six or seven. And he came to the pastor's meeting one, one week, and he, he was so excited. We had 13 people in church. And this is after like four years of being there serving. I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. That's faithfulness. That's having a whole heart into the ministry that God's called you to. That's awesome. That's powerful. Would I be found faithful? Or would, would my heart get divided and, and myself take over? Self-centeredness comes from having a divided heart. If you love the Lord with all your heart, you don't really care about yourself and, and what happens to you. It's not about you, it's about Him. Inconsistent or wavering. And this is not... Met, if, you, if, you're, if you feel convicted or condemned about what I'm going to say, I am not talking to you, but the Holy Spirit may be. If you're inconsistent in your walk, could it be? Now, I'm not talking about you know, going into sin and out of sin and all of that stuff. Maybe that happens too. But I'm talking about just doing the disciplines in your prayer, in your reading, in your attendance. Hello? You know, it's really sad in our culture today. The, the reality is that Christians think if they go to church once or twice a month, they're being faithful, consistent Christians. Um, once or tw- an hour or two a month? That's, that's not consistent, faithful walking. A divided heart is fearful and worried and anxious. Everything just seems to be the circumstances of your life take over your life instead of you standing over your circumstances. I think it was Papa Vince who, who asked me the question years and years ago, maybe even before we came here. I was talking about being under these circumstances and whoever it was said, what are you doing under there? I said, under where? Under the circumstances. You're not supposed to be under the circumstances. You're a follower of Christ. You're supposed to be over the circumstances. But if you feel like you're under the circumstances and you're fearful and you're worried, you don't know how you're going to do this, and what happens if the world ends, and oh, whoever's going to get elected, and uh, oh my goodness, the country's going to fall apart, and the stock market's going to crash, and we're all going to die. Maybe it's because you don't have your faith holy in the living God. If you need wisdom, this is James chapter 1. If you need wisdom, ask, this is in the New Living. I thought it would need to put it up there because I read it in the New King James and it speaks to me, but not the same way. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you. That's a pretty powerful statement right there. He will not rebuke you for your asking. But when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in Him, is in God alone. Alone, singular, solo. Do not waver for a person who's div- who with divided loyalty, again, divided loyalty, is unsettled as a wave on the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow. Their loyalty is divided. Now, that, where I underlined that, that's the same word. It's the only, there's only two places in the entire New Testament that that word is used. Dipsukos, two souls. Divided heart. Loyalty is divided between God and the world. They are unstable in everything they do. Is there stability in your life or is it unstable? Are you fearful? Are you worried? Are you concerned about every little thing? Are there fights? Are there quarrels? Is all of this stuff going on in your life? Perhaps it's time to turn our eyes upon Him and focus on Him and and recommit ourselves to loving Him with a whole heart. Jesus said it this way, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. New King James says money. The Old King James says mammon. It's interesting because I know that people don't like it when I talk about money, because I hear it. Hello? 
But Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven or hell. Because it's not about the money, it's about your heart. Do you have a whole heart that's in love with him? Or is part of you love him and part of you love this? And what this will get you. You can't love one without despising the other. That's what Jesus said. It's kind of an all or nothing thing, isn't it? If we were playing poker, you'd have to go all in. Elijah came near to all the people and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. I didn't put this on the screen because it would have taken like 20 slides. But I printed it off out of the New Living. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Easy for you to say. Deuteronomy. Chapter 30, verses 11 through 20. And it's really interesting. In, in, in my old Bible that, um, that uh, I wished I had gotten the binding fix instead of buying a new one because it's got all kinds of notes in it, probably 25 years ago, my mom wrote in my Bible. And she said, I want this scripture read at my funeral. This is the command I'm giving you today. It is not too difficult for you to understand. And it is not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you might ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it? It is not kept beyond the sea so that no one might ask, who will cross the sea and bring it to us so that we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. I believe that this message is so crystal clear and it's so easy to understand that all of us should be able to understand this. And it is on the lips and in the heart. It, it is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey. Now listen. Today I'm giving you a choice between life and death. between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands, decrees, regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter and occupy. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and if you're drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed." You will not live a long, good life in the land you're, you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I realize this was written to the nation of Israel, um, but I believe it's applicable to us, especially when Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I believe that even now there's a choice before us, before me, before you. Will I love him with all my heart? Will I continue to vacillate back and forth? Sometimes my life feels like a windshield wiper. You know, I'm hot for God and then eh, not so much. And I'm hot for God and not so much. Why is that? Because the old man comes up and wants to take over my life and I, I fall into the thinking of the carnal flesh instead of the spiritual man that I am. So it's a choice. We've been given everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. Um, everything is the same as all. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will honor you. Humble yourselves. What does it take? You know, it's really not that complicated. Christianity is probably the least complicated religion ever. You and I are sinners, doomed, for separation from God for eternity. But God loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. Isn't that cool? To take my place. To pay the price 
that I would have had to pay that I could never pay. So Jesus came and he paid that price. And then he came and he rose from the grave on the third day and he's calling people to him all the time. So even now, if you're feeling that tug, don't resist it. Even, even if you've given your life to him 50 years ago, you know what? Humble yourselves before the Lord because I guarantee you that there's not a person in this room, including myself, including all the elders, there's not a person in this room that can honestly say, I have loved the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, all my days. We have our days that we do. We have our days that we mess up. So let's be honest and humble ourselves and admit it before each other and before God. I want to share with you. You can stay there, Ernie. I'm just going to talk about you. Okay? I want to share with you the story of Ernie Delage. Did I say that correctly? Ernie, um, first time I met Ernie was probably three or four months ago. He showed up here after church. Everybody else had gone. I'm walking out to my car, and in comes this red SUV. And I'm like, who's that? And Ernie gets out, and we start to talk. And um, we talked about what he was reading, and I showed him the version Bible on his phone and all of this stuff, and, and he started coming more. He, I think he's been here every week since. And then he comes to me and he says, I want to be baptized. I need to be baptized. So I met with him this week, and I wanted to know how he came to faith. He was raised in a Catholic church, and um, at work, he works for Fletcher Allen, well, not Fletcher Allen anymore, UVM Medical Center, as a, cur- as a courier. And he'd be at the post office down in Burlington every, every morning at 6.30 in the morning or so. There's another guy there who was an independent courier, and they get to talking, this guy named Ken. Ken gave him a book. What's the name of the book, Ernie? Uh, Jesus, Calling. Jesus Calling. So Ken, in obedience to the Holy Spirit, after they've talked, gives Ernie a book. Ernie begins to read the book. It's a daily devotional. Begins to read the book. In reading this daily devotional, Ernie comes to the realization that Ernie needs to repent of his sins and give his life to Christ. Now what's really cool about this, this is, I'm, I got goosebumps, because what's really cool about this story is, it wasn't a preacher, wasn't a pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, it was a man who was faithful and obedient to what the Holy Spirit said to do, gave Ernie a book. And shortly after that, you went on disability, right? So right at the right time, because now you've got time to read this book. And there's, there began this hunger to grow in him. And he began to read, he began to read that devotion. He began to read some Joyce Meyer stuff. And then he reading his Bible. And in reading his Bible, he came to the conclusion that he needs to be baptized. Because what he told me was, I was baptized as a baby, but they didn't do that in the Bible. So we're going to baptize Ernie today. So we're going to celebrate an awesome... I mean, we're celebrating communion. I mean, really, this is a celebration. And celebrating a baptism, it's a celebration. And Ernie, Ernie is not only being baptized out of obedience, but he's being baptized into the church. And he's going, to, he's going to find his place in this local body of believers. And God is going to begin to pour into him and speak to him, destiny, destiny, destiny. And who knows? Is Ernie an evangelist? Is Ernie a teacher? Is he, does he have the gift of helps? Is, is, what is it that God wants to use Ernie for? Who knows? So I said all that, to, and going back to this choice, I put this choice before you today. Choose life or choose curses. Choose blessings or choose curses. Have you made that choice? Maybe you prayed a little prayer like I did when I was six with my mom in our den. I remember it. I was six. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Well, I don't know if that's biblical, number one. I don't know how effective it was, but I do know this. At least there was a hook in me. And God never let go. He kept reeling in, he kept reeling in, and there was a fight. Because when I turned 14, somebody flipped the stupid switch in me. And I went and did a bunch of stupid things. 
But then God got a hold of me. You know, there's, there's a time where each one of us, I don't care how long you've been walking with Christ, if you've not come to the place of brokenness before him, then you're not at the place he wants you to be. Brokenness. Not, not broken not broken so that you can't function, but broken so that you understand that it's all about him and that you can do nothing. But through him, you can do anything. So I'm going to pray, and um, we're going to close and go downstairs and baptize Ernie. But, um, and you that have been here, you that, are, you that are catalyst, you know that I don't do altar calls very often. Correct? Today, by the Holy Spirit, I, I'm, I believe I'm hearing that there needs to be a call for people to humble themselves before God. Come forward and make a statement. In, in walking forward, you are humbling yourself before God. You know, and it's really tough if you're an elder or a deacon or you've had a ministry or whatever, you know, that, that, that you've, you've been walking this walk. What do I need to do that? Well, have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind, all your days? None of us have. I don't want to be manipulative, but I want to give you an opportunity to express to God and to us that you're coming to the place of admitting that and wanting to love him with your whole heart.